You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. The song changes so much from what oh, it is in the beginning. It's just like now we're happy. I'm like, what the heck is happening? I stopped singing it because it's hard to it's hard to keep doing it. I remember playing that guitar hero. That was my first introduction really to that song. Alright, okay. On a scale of one to Freddy, how good are you at guitar hero? Uh, I am Jimmy on that scale. <laughs> Like, and we are blood related and we share a lot of Are you of almost talent. as good as him? No, no, no. He's way better. If you didn't know, Freddie Wong, Jimmy's brother, was Used like to. one of the best guitar hero players like in the world. World, yeah. <laughs> Showman specifically. Because a lot of times the competitions back when they had competition with guitar hero, people would just go up and just plank, 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 plank. But Freddie, having played guitar and you know, was a big fan of Led Zeppelin and other like classic rock bands would throw it behind his head, like play like headbang into it and play there's the that one youtube video from one of their early videos where he's like riding a bike or yeah, something. yeah he was riding a bike and playing behind, through the fire and the flames put on that, that video on terry the one where he's like yeah, yeah they've got like a tv in the back of a car and he's riding a bike behind it and playing it or something yeah it's like, ridiculous it's awesome all right tangent uh, tangent yeah anyway uh how's it going everybody you are listening slash watching the command zone podcast i'm your host jimmy wong how's it it's Josh Lee quiet i keep saying how's it i'm so sorry no, I, but I, i'm saying that's H-O- our thing h-o-w apostrophe s space i-t and i'm saying h-o-w-z-i-t yeah that's yeah. right so obviously we sang a song that involved the train and this train is actually a dragon engine we're doing a deck tech breakdown of the commander i wanted to build from the commander 17 set which is ramos dragon engine I'm pretty excited for this one, actually, because this is, was my second most wanted to build. Yeah, I mean, it is powerful. I didn't do anything spectacularly creative, I don't think, with it, because I just put some of my favorite cards that were about 10 mana the cost <laughs> <laughs> that you normally would not be able to. I want to cast this card. Yeah. <laughs> Ramos will help me. Yeah, exactly. That sounds fun. So uh, before we get into that, let's talk about our sponsors, CardKingdom.com, uh, as evidenced by this really nice playmat on the table. That's where is, you can go to buy all those 10 mana cards we're about to talk about. Yes, and they're probably going to be pretty affordable given the fact that they're 10 mana and don't see that much play otherwise. But uh, use the affiliate link though when you buy them. You oh, go yes. to a cardkingdom.com slash command zone. That's our only affiliate link now. We don't have a bunch of them. <laughs> I don't know why we ended up having like three or four different ones, but there's no Game Nights one. There's no C17. There's no Arch Enemy. It's just cardkingdom.com slash command zone. Use that when you buy all of your magic product or when you buy your Ultra Pro product and you will be supporting the show. Yeah. You can still use the old links. They'll still work, but we're just simplifying it from here on out. Ultra Pro is the other sponsor for the show as well. Uh, I mean, look, love Ultra Pro. I used to, I remember when I was a kid buying Ultra Pro sleeves for the first time and I switched around for a bit and then there was complaints about quality here and there. And then when I finally came back to Ultra Pro with the Eclipse sleeves, I have been very happy. Every single limited event and pre-release I've done now has been with those sleeves, and I haven't had to change them out yet. I haven't had a single one break on me. I'll even say I use the Sriracha sleeves because it's kind of my become my yeah. thing because of that episode of Game Nights uh, for my pre-releases and my live drafts and everything. And I bought a bunch of them because I thought, incorrectly, but I thought that they would probably break apart because... You know, honestly, the sleeves were known for doing that in the past. They're and art I've, sleeves, too. Yeah, and I've been using, like, the same package for, like, ever since um, Ether Revolt. <laughs> so, so like, nice. that's how long they've lasted. And I'm like, well, geez, what am I going to do with all these Sriracha sleeves? Like, I have a stack, like, this big of them because <laughs> I didn't go through them as fast as I thought because the quality's come yeah. up. So je- definitely check out Ultra Pro. That does support the show. The other way to support the show is directly by going to patreon.com slash command zone. In fact, we call out one lucky patron every single episode, and this episode is dedicated to Zach Zach Schuler. Thank you, Zachary Schuler. I don't know if that's your full name, but you are a a, a patron, and we thank you for your support. A gentleman and a scholar. Gentleman and a scholar. Or Zachary. You rock. Thank you so much. It's probably Zach, because he would have put Zachary on there. You know, I buried the lead again. (laughs) You just like, you love that term now. (laughs) I forgot all about, well, I think you used it originally, and I was like, I get it. You're burying the, you're like spoiling something, or before it's, what, it's, boy. We actually have an Ixalan preview card today. Oh my gosh, we didn't even say that we have one, but we have yeah, one. Yeah, we do have one, uh, and it's a fun one, and it's a card that I'm very excited to preview for all of you, because Hang on a second. It's the kind of card that I have. Um, it's the kind of card that I've always wanted to play in Commander because this kind of effect 
is really fun for me, honestly, and I think it's the kind of thing that causes mad chaos as well. But this Ow. card, it's an interesting one. We get to cheat with our preview card because of Game Nights. Mm -hmm. um, I think by now you will know. Actually, Game Nights might be related to. Are you burying the lead again? I'm burying it. We're not. I don't. I think officially we're not supposed to talk about that yet. So forget what I just said. I was very vague. Anyway, we just happen to have our preview card here. Yes. Unrelated to Game Nights. Okay. Our Ixalan <laughs> preview card is. <laughs> Axis, Axis of, of mortality. Mora mortality, almost, almost. said morality. I mean that too. You're an immoral person if you play this card, I think, because it's kind of it's kind of wild. It's we an enchantment. Like... And then you do the thing, like in game nights. Yeah, Terry, <laughs> make that happen. <laughs> so Axis of Mortality is a four white white enchantment, and it says at the beginning of your upkeep, you may have two target players exchange life totals. And then it says the Church of Dusk teaches there is no gain without loss. <laughs> No triumph without sacrifice. No drink of exquisite crimson without a dying gasp. Yeah, and that part of it costs two in the white to do that part. <laughs> exquisite crimson means blood, right? Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's the vampires. Church of Dusk teaches there's no game without loss. So it's two in the white. You may not, a players may not gain life this turn. If a player loses life, instead... Yeah, exquisite crimson. Okay, none of that stuff is true. Yeah, so this is a card where, which allows you for six mana at every upkeep, your upkeep, you can have two players exchange life totals. And it's a very ridiculous card because one, it's six mana, so it's a little hard to cast, I think, in Commander. And not, not bad. It's not bad, but I'm usually very protective about my six mana slot. because I, I generally don't want to like cast something for six mana that does nothing. <laughs> it does literally nothing, yeah. But if you can flash this out, I feel like this is a card that causes a lot of chaos at tables because... Someone's about to go out. I've had games, by the way, where I sit at like two life and everyone goes just like, eh, I just ignore him. He's fine. I'll I can kill him whenever yeah, I want Yeah, I'll kill him whenever I want. And then if you have something like access and mortality, you can put the person in lead position all the way back just like that. And there's no better way to, to have someone, I think, like flail than have them go from like 56 life to two. I think this, you know, there's a lot of life gain decks out there now. And I'm not saying necessarily you play this in a life gain deck, although you might, but you play this against a life gain deck. Oh, yeah. They've done all this work with the Lauro or somebody to gain a bunch of life, and you're just like, boom. Now I'm at 95. I think this is best position when you use it as a surprise. So if you can flash this out before your upkeep, it's the best. Because sometimes someone will be like, I'm in such a dominant position, I get to swing out with everything and not worry about dying. But they don't realize you have a card that lets you switch life totals. <laughs> and then they'll leave themselves open for however many turns because they tapped out or did whatever, you know, feeling in the commanding position. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. It's going to only have fringe use, right? It's not super powerful. It's just a little bit cutesy. Um, it's definitely cutesy. Yeah. And it's slow. Gosh. Yeah. Like, I do like the... I mean, could you imagine a game where this stuck around for like five turns? It would be super chaotic because you don't have to switch your own too, right? Mm -hmm. So I can just be like, Craig, you're at what? Jimmy, you're at what? Man, eh, just switch you Yeah, guys. just whatever. Just for funzies. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's definitely... <laughs> you know, or it's political. Well, hey, if you don't... If you if Ooh, attack him yeah. and not me... Then I'll give you I'll give you his life total. Yeah, if you're in or the game, I guess I'll give you the uh, third person because you don't want to attack the person who you're going to get their life total. Right. I guess it depends if it's a very sort of twisty and turny meta where people are always being sunk down or put up due to various things. This is a fun way to really mess with that. If you had five color Marchesa, but you don't, but I'm just saying a deck that controls its life total like your deck does, where yeah. you're, you're actually purposely bringing yours down, that could be something that you do. You know, you bring your life total down with right. like you know like greed type effects or things like that and then all of a sudden you switch it with somebody else that's pretty good yeah i'll I mean, do it i think the deck would already have to be doing that stuff i'm not going to build a deck for axis of mortality though no no and i think this is also very meta dependent i think in certain play groups this is just going to do tons of work i could definitely see it in a more casual play group as just being one of those cards where everyone goes like oh not again you know but even even in like a veteran like very spiky group i could see this just doing work because Taking someone that was in the commanding position and putting them at a, at a position now where if everyone goes like, oh, we can all just swing out and kill them this turn, then, you know, that's like, that's pretty significant. Be careful, though, because I could, could see playing this card out and then the person realizing that's in the commanding position that you're likely to switch their life total because they're in the commanding position and just being like, okay, kill you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you not on my not if your before. life total is super high as a result. Well, but yeah, but you have to last till you're upkeep or else flash I'm it I'm assuming you're you have to flash it in. in. You yeah. have to flash it in, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Anyway. Ixalan. Yeah, that is Ixalan Axis of Mortality. Don't open that in your sealed pool. But do don't it. open that in your sealed pool. It's true, actually. <laughs> don't do not do that. But otherwise, if open it. If you do, it. you're bad. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> you're bad. <laughs> you're bad. You're bad at magic. If you open that in your seal pool, you are bad at magic. Oh, boy. Yep, that's how it works. <laughs> All right, moving on. Let's talk about Ramos Dragon Engine. It's a deck tech for a five-color dragon. I'm very excited for this card because it is a commander that just... Wait, wait. We buried the lead again. Wait, why? Well, we're wearing Oh, something. my goodness. We are burying a lot of leads. Someone get the shovel. Someone get the shovel. Okay, so really quickly here. Thank you for listening to our Ixalan preview. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, if you're still here and you want one of these cool shirts, here, let me. Uh, it has something on the back, too. Oh, yeah. Game Nights. It's the show that we do. We made a shirt for it. As you can tell, we're also matching with the logo behind us. <laughs> Man, Man we, we are, are tools. so on brand. <laughs> no, I don't know if that's how I'd put it. <laughs> I don't know if it's good. We've been called like... shills before, but I think we've reached max. Are you a shill, shill if it's your own thing that you created? I don't know. I don't. I just hate that term because it's just it was such a weak way of being like, oh, advertising makes the world go round. <laughs> think about it. Anyway, so we're going to be giving away a bunch of these T-shirts to lucky viewers like yourselves. Please don't call us a shill. The way that we're going to do it is very simple. Uh, all you have to do is go on Facebook and share the post that this episode is a part of. So um, we're going to post like, here's our Ramos deck tech slash Ixalan preview. And then we'll write there to share this post to be entered into our t-shirt giveaway. Or you can also just post on Facebook in a public forum. Or Twitter. Or Twitter using the hashtag Game Nights because this is a Game Night t-shirt and link to this video. That's it. That's it. That's you it. can really link any of our videos. And we're going to choose a decent number of winners, too, because we are working on some new distribution methods, ways to ensure that we're, because you know, usually it's just me sitting here shipping all this stuff out. And if my life gets in the way, it's very hard for me to be on time with this sort of stuff. So we're going to get a lot of shirts out this time around, and I don't need to stress about it. So it makes me happy. And uh, we will announce the winners, everybody that's going to get a T-shirt on September 20th, which is the day that the new Game Nights will be released. Uh, so there you go. There Make you sure go. you enter. Again, use the hashtag Game Nights and just post any of our videos anywhere, basically. Yep, pretty yeah, much. Pretty easy. Okay. All right. Now, now, now to the lead, <laughs> which has been adequately <laughs> All buried. All aboard. Ramos Dragon Engine. <laughs> that is what this episode is about. Uh, I built a fairly straightforward, I think, simple deck around uh, Ramos. So let's read Ramos. It's a six mana, colorless, 4-4 four, four legendary artifact creature dragon with flying... Whenever you cast a spell, put a plus one, plus one counter on Ramos for each of that spell's colors. Remove five plus, and the other part is remove five plus one, plus one counters from Ramos. Add white, white, blue, blue, black, black, red, red, green, green to your mana pool. Activate this ability only once each turn. So you get progenitus mana. You get progenitus mana or 10 mana total, two of each color. And the way that his first part works, let's say you cast a giant growth, you get one plus one plus one counter on Ramos because that spell is one color. But it's anytime you cast a spell, it's not on resolution. It's just when you cast it. So this is going to be a really interesting deck. Uh, Ramos can only do his ability once a turn, similar to the Marisol deck we teched last week. But if you can flicker him, bounce him, or return him to your hand and recast him in the same turn and get him back up to those five plus one plus one counters, he can do it again. And, and because it gives you 10 mana, basically, you can yeah, often do that. You can often do that for sure. So... What do we think about Ramos? I think this uh, is sort of the most combo tastic of the. Yeah. Just because any any card that has the ability to give you ten mana is yeah. Any absurd. legendary card kind of just gives you free mana off of stuff is going to be super powerful because it's one of the pillars of our format and uh, one of the most basic ways that we always talk about you can break the game is cheating mana cost. Well, mm -hmm. one way to cheat mana cost is to get ten mana for spending five mana. Yeah. And Which sometimes, Ramos basically does all the time, basically, right? Yeah, he does it quite a lot, and there are a lot of there obviously aren't that many spells that are five colors, and you don't want to actually in this deck you'll see you don't actually want to put that many in here because a lot of times you'd rather I in my case I'd rather work for synergy. So the options so far as building this deck is you could build it to just immediately ramp out Ramos, which is kind of what this deck wants to do, and then just play any number of five color spells combined with a ten mana win the game spell. And you could probably do this by turn five. That's pretty crazy, too, because you, when you think about the, the cards we talk about that sort of win the game, there are a lot, and they're usually at like eight, nine mana. And yep. the fact that Ramos can just do that on turn five or six yeah. is kind of nuts. Kind of nuts. So 
the plan for the deck I decided to build was just literally built around plus one, plus one synergies. Uh, because one of the things that I realized is going to happen with Ramos is that if you want to use his ability twice in a turn, being able to recast him and then having just having to have another five color spell in your hand is not going to be as likely unless you're drawing a ton of cards. So I'd rather rely on having plus one, plus one counters on other creatures and finding ways to shift them over to Ramos or abuse them or move them from Ramos to them if someone decides to target Ramos. So there's a lot of different things that you can do with the deck. But the idea is that Ramos is just there to come out when he needs to and then lay down a Whopper. Otherwise, the rest of the deck should function. I mean, if you played this deck without Ramos, you would probably just avoid the 10 mana cards if you could. But then you'd also have a ton of really buff creatures, which I like a lot. So here come the categories. The first is a card that we have not talked about since it has come out. It is Rayhan, Last of the Obzon. And this card is actually potentially one of the best cards in the deck. So Rehan is one of the partner commanders from Commander 2016. You're right. We never even did a deck tech or anything about Rehan. I don't think we've even acknowledged Rehan's existence. She was waiting for Ramos. I think it's she, right? Oh, it is a she. Rehan, last of the Abzan, cost one black and green for a 0-0 zero, zero legendary creature human warrior. But Rehan enters the battlefield with three plus one plus one counters on it. And then it says, whenever a creature you control dies or is put into the command zone, if it had one or more 1-1 one, one counters on it, you can put that many 1-1 one, one counters on target creature. So you just get to move those counters to something else. Yep. Um, Rayhan's ability is essentially like an enchantment. And it's one of the things that's really important in this deck is there aren't that many effects out there that just allow you to move all of the counters from one thing to another. Uh, so let's say you had Rayhan and a couple of other creatures with plus and plus counters on it. You find a way to sacrifice them, and then you can throw those counters on Ramos without actually having to cast anything. So Ramos could be out, and you could just, you could sack two creatures with an altar, get more mana, and then throw that on Ramos, get even more mana, and that way you do get to utilize the full ten. Because I think a lot of what Ramos is about is just finding ways to get the counters on him and use it. Because you can also use Ramos once per turn. Right. So this is a way to do it on someone else's turn. And then, you know, having Flash is obviously very important in this deck because of that. All decks. Vidal Canori, all decks. Yeah. We, I should also mention that Ramos is a five-color general because all five of the colors appear in his rule, his or her rules text below the creature. All right. Another very important... It would be really bad if Ramos was not five-color. Oh, yeah, because the card just wouldn't make it. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't would literally be unplayable <laughs> in our in our format. Um, this next card is a very important card for any plus one plus one counters deck. It's Corpse Jack Menace. Say two, a black and a green for a four four creature fungus. If one or more plus one plus one counters will be placed on the creature you control, twice that many are placed instead. So with something like Rayhan, you could actually just sack Rayhan and get six counters on Ramos if you have Corpse Jack Menace out as well. Or even at that point, whether you're casting a, a two-color spell, you're getting four yep. counters rather than two. Yeah. yeah. Corpse Jack is, again, these are all enchantment. I call them enchantment creatures, even though they're not that type. Is in their ability is an enchantment that affects the synergies of what your deck is going for. And Corpse Jack Menace is a very powerful card, but potentially not as powerful as this next one, which is another card that I... I haven't gotten I around don't... to putting this in as many decks, but it, it, it belongs in so many of my decks. Especially four-color decks. Yeah, so it's Crystalline Crawler. It's four mana for a 1-1 one, one artifact creature. It's a construct, but it has Converge. So Crystalline Crawler enters the battlefield with a 1-1 one, one counter on it for each color of mana spent to cast it. Um, and then you can remove a plus one counter from it to add one mana of any color to your mana pool, and you can also tap it to put a 1-1 one, one counter on it. So... It just can generate a lot of mana really quickly. Instant speed. Yeah. Uh, combined with those last two cards we just talked about, this thing can often pump out six, seven mana in a single turn. And the best part about it is that it's not a zero, zero, like hanger back walker. So it doesn't die. So it never dies more. if you take all the counters off. Yeah. And the fact that it can always give itself one mana each turn, guaranteed, means that it's it functions at the very baseline as a four mana, add one mana of any color to your mana pool at instant speed. The fact that you don't have it's to really tap good. it to do this ability, Crystalline Crawler, I think, is just one of the best sort of mana rocks you can ask for in a deck like this because it synergizes with the rest of the deck and sometimes in ridiculous manner. Um, a lot of this deck, honestly, and we'll talk about protecting it later, is about getting three to four creatures on the battlefield, and then those synergies within themselves will just make the deck do this. So it's just, and they all grow. Yeah, and, and then, then Ramos you... pumps it into Ramos, and he's like, huh, and he pops out 10 mana. That's it. That's him doing that. That's what it sounds like when you pop out 10 mana. Yeah. All right. The next one is, no, sorry, not Spike Feeder. Spike Weaver. Uh, there's a whole oh, series of Spike so cards. But the big thing is that all the Spike cards have 
a activated ability to pay two mana to remove a plus one plus one counter from that creature and to put it on another target creature. But then a lot of them also have like you another ability where you sort of get some effect. Get some effect. Yeah, yeah you can remove a counter to gain life. In this case, Spike Weaver is two green green for a zero zero spike creature that you can pay one mana. It comes in the battlefield with three plus one plus one counters on it. Uh, and you can pay one to remove a plus one plus one counter to prevent all combat damage that will be dealt this turn. So it's also fog. a fog on the stick. So good. Which is really, really good. Yeah. And I was looking through all the spike cards and I was thinking about putting them all in just because they have the ability to move counters onto other creatures. But it costs two mana to do so. More importantly, this has the ability to do so. Sometimes all you need is just one more counter on a creature like Ramos. So this can like add that last one. But having the fog on the stick, I think, is really important, especially if you're able to feed the Spike Weaver with plus one, plus one counters from other places. Spike Weaver, I have in quite a few decks, and it's one of those cards that sometimes your opponent just can't beat. If you have ways to replenish the counters. Yeah, and they're just like, if I can't kill that creature, I just can't ever get any damage through on you. So, yeah. yeah. And, and that, with a utility ability you already want, which is moving counters around, is mm -hmm. really good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the next category is called Abuse Ramos. Uh, and it's sort of a count. It's a it's a combination between abusing his ability and also having recasting, reblinking him sort of once per turn. Abilities. Getting around. It's kind of like Marcel, right? Where like yeah. they put the same clause. You can only use it once per turn, which doesn't stop all the shenanigans. It just makes you sort of take one additional step. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this first card, I would 100% run the original version if I could afford it. It's Magus of the Candelabra. It's a green for a human wizard one two, and you can pay X to tap it and untap X target lands. When your commander is generating you 10 mana out of nowhere, you're going to want to filter some of those into different colors. And Magus of the Candelabra does a great job of doing that. Because Ramos gives you white, white, blue, blue, black, black, red, red, green, green. But sometimes let's say you need three green or four green. Three red. Magus can definitely take that mana and untap a lot of lands. And then sometimes even cast another spell to put more counters on Ramos. Or use that mana to do the sort of craziness, which is like blinking it, recasting it, all in the same turn. Also, if you have, you know, like bounce lands, things that tap for more than one yeah. color, more than one mana, then all of a sudden, Temple of the False Gods, you're actually gaining mana when you do it. Yeah. The card, the originally he was talking about is Candelabra of Thanos, which is a it's very, like very, very expensive card. <laughs> yeah. But it's a really good card. Um, and finally, a place to use this stinking card. <laughs> finally. Finally. Legacy Weapon. It's fat. It's a seven mana legendary artifact, and you can just pay Wooberg to remove target permanent from the game. Exile, to exile target, target permanent, permanent yeah. yeah, which is pretty crazy considering if you have Ramos, it's just two things gone at once. Um, Legacy Weapon also has the text if it would be put into the graveyard from anywhere, you could reveal it and shuffle it into your library instead, so you'll always be able to redraw it. But it's, I think, the cleanest way to use Ramos's mana because you could use him to either just cast this at first and you have three mana left over. And then let's say you have two untapped lands, you can use it at least once. Or you can just have it to be, you know, it's because it's an instant speed thing. And if you're able to use Ramos on every turn. That's what I was going to say. You know, you're going to want ways to use Ramos on everybody else's turn. Because if Ramos has 10 counters, mm -hmm. then I can remove five during my turn, get, you know, 10 mana, use it. And, but then I want to remove five on somebody else's turn and get 10 mana on their turn. Is it only once? Is, is it each turn or is it your turn? Each yeah. turn. So... So Legacy Weapon gives you that ability to sort of get maximum efficiency from Ramos. Because I can assume that in this deck you have ways to put 20 counters on Ramos, but yeah. how do you take advantage of that? Well, just like Marisil, use it on my turn, use it on Jimmy's turn, use it on Craig's turn, use it on, you know. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of instants in here as well. Like a card like Obzon Charm literally just gets the counters on him. Because... Oh, yeah. It's just three mana put... put uh, yeah. There, that's three, and then you, you choose the mode of put two plus one plus one Plus counters. counters on a creature, yeah. So for three mana, you get 10? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the best cards in the deck as Obs and Charm because you could also just use it to be a path to exile for yourself or in cases of card draw, you need it, you can use it there. But mostly, you're, you're going to want to use it to have a, be a three-mana way to instantly put five counters on Ramos. It's a pretty good ritual. Yeah. It's better than three dark rituals. Yeah. yeah. So another great way to obviously use and all... And you can do it at instant speed, so you can do it on their mm -hmm. turn. Oh, that's... Obs and Charm is really good. Yeah, it, I looked at all the charms. A lot of lists have every single charm on it, and like I don't think that's right. I think you just got to pick and choose your battles, because I think either flooding a list with five mana, five color spells is a bad idea, and flooding it with all just the cards that have multiple colors in it is a bad idea, too, because it needs to synergize with itself. Okay, sorry, I derailed us. We were talking about sort of abusing him, abusing. blinking him, using him more than once. Yeah. yeah, so Momentary Blink is one of my favorite um, sort of one-use instances, but in this case, it's got flashbacks, so you can use it twice. And it's also an immediate blink. So it's one in a white instant exile target creature you control, then return it to your battlefield, to the battlefield under its owner's control, and you can flash it back for three in the blue. So 
when you have 10 mana and you're able to momentary blink and then use that flashback again, you could potentially activate Ramos three times in a single turn based on what's in your hand. Oh, yeah, because you use the two of the 10 mana to cast momentary blink. You still have eight left. Yep. You somehow put use that eight, put more counters you on You definitely him. can use that eight mana to find a way to put more counters on Ramos. And probably have some left over. Then you, use, mm-hmm. then you remove it, use four of the new 10 mana to, to blink flash in. back momentary blink. Do it again, add more counters. Oh, yeah, so you could easily generate maybe like 20, 30 mana yeah. in a turn. That's really good. Yeah, momentary blink, I think, is one of the best ways because you're just because the first mode is first time you cast is two mana, and the second time is four, and when you're generating 10 mana potentially each time with it, you will be able to I wonder if there's there. a Ramos Storm deck out there then because there definitely it is. feels like you turn a lot of cards into rituals, basically. Mm-hmm. Abzone Charm becomes a ritual. Momentary blink becomes a ritual, but it also has its original ability so it becomes like a a flexible ritual yeah the big thing you want to do with ramos if you're going to go full storm is to recast him or replay him or re-blink him like two to three times and have leftover man to do so momentary blink is one of the few ways to do it and so is obviously dead eye navigator hey our good friends it's becoming the prophet of crew fix of the show where we just talk that oh that's bad that is bad that's bad that is they ban prophet okay Mm -hmm. let's let's just gloss over it as fast as possible did a navigator blinks Ramos. It's good. It's really pretty good. good. Pretty good. Do that. Um, and of course, why not have two Ramoses with Sakashima the Imposter? This is a card, and I didn't talk about it, but I put it in the Marisol deck. I, oh, also. really? This is becoming like it's in my Vile Smasher deck. It's becoming a card where, like, if you're in blue, you kind of run it because if you want your commander, then yeah. you want two of your commander, right? Yeah. And it also just is a regular clone for two blue blue, and it has the ability to return it to its owner's hand at the beginning of the next end step. So it has. A lot of utility. Um, Sakashima, again, is a very specific card where it still is Sakashima the Imposter, but it is copying another card. So you it's can one have, of the only cards that can copy a legendary creature, basically. Yeah, and have it both exist on the battlefield at the same time. So yeah. if you have two Ramoses now, oh my goodness, then you are able to create Creating use, 20 mana every time? Yeah, you where you essentially you have two engines going, so you have one feed it the other one. You drop 10 mana off, do it something else, and then find a way to blink that's, this one. You know, like That sounds sweet. Yeah, not to mention if you're able to blink this back to your hand at the next end step, you could potentially flash it out. I mean, there's lots of ways to oh, abuse yeah. Sakashima. You can use the mana to blink it back, replay it. Now it's another copy of Ramos. This yeah. might be an engine of itself. Well, I, what you would do is you'd blink it back to your hand at the end step, and then the next person's turn, you would, or you use the mana. I don't know actually how you would work it, but the whole point is you would be able to cast Sakashima again, yeah. and then, I don't know, just... I like the fact that you can recast certain clones. That's the big thing to me. I like the fact that I could have two Ramoses out. I mean, hey, sometimes you only need like two Corpse Corpse Jack Menaces too. Now, let's talk about moving counters around and adding them on. This this is one of the the things I wanted to do in this deck, but the problem is that often it's a very one-time effect. So you lose a little bit of card advantage when you do it. But we'll talk about the card draw later on because having plus one, plus one counters on a lot of different cards means you can draw a ton of cards especially if you're doing the abusey things with Ramos where you're having to enter the battlefield constantly. Some mm-hmm. cards are going to be like, hey, I also like doing that. So the two cards that do this at instant speed are Bio Shift and Fate Transfer. And these are conveniently some of the best cards in the deck because let's look at Bio Shift. Let's look at that CMC. It costs it's, one mana it costs for an instant. one mana for an instant. That, but. but it's hybrid blue-green, so it would put two counters on Ramos for one mana at instant speed. And it also says, move any number of 1-1 counters from target creature onto another target creature with the same controller. Yeah. So you just take a bunch, put them on Ramos. Actually, you don't even need a bunch. You just need three. You just so need you three, have five. yeah. Well, that's really good. It's really good. Again, um, it turns it into a ritual. Yeah, these are all rituals, essentially. And Fate Transfer is the same thing. It's one and then a hybrid blue-black. So this counts as two colors. This is actually even better because it's move all counters from target creature onto another target creature. So you could you could steal from somebody else. Yeah. yeah. Or if like I don't know, like there I'm sure there's gonna be some corner case where some creature has minus one minus one counters on it on the other side of the battlefield and you can move <laughs> that stuff around because it doesn't have to be under your control. Oh yeah, interesting. But it also adds two counters to Ramos. So those are the two of the instant speed, take counters and shift them over somewhere else. Um one of the this is the Kragus card on in the deck is Gave or Gave, Guru of Spores. It's Gave. Gave. It's Gave. So this is an Obzon card, two in Obzon, five mana total. It enters the battlefield with five plus one plus one counters on it and has two really important abilities. You can pay one to remove a plus one plus one counter from a creature you control to create a one one green sapling green to- uh, token. 
And then you can also pay one to sacrifice a creature and put a 1-1 counter on a target creature. So this essentially does the same thing that Spike Feeder does, where for two mana, you can take a counter and put it anywhere you want. But in this case, you're paying one to make a creature and remove a counter, and then you're paying one to sack a creature to put a counter on another thing. But you can sack anything you want. So this combo is obviously very well with Rayhan because he wants creatures oh, to die. Yeah. So you can sacrifice any creatures at this point. Um, and especially if you've got one of those doublers. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, every time you sack a creature, you're creating twice as many counters when it moves someplace else. That's why I wanted this deck to work without Ramos, and all these creatures work really well with each other, because if you have Gave out and someone like Rayhan, then you can choose, all right, am I going to try and go wide? Am I going to try and make one creature really big? There's a lots of different ways that you could go around using the counters to your advantage in just a regular board state situation. Um, but in the, in the case of Ramos, Gave is a three-color card. You're going to add counters on by doing that, and so it's not that hard, really, to get the counters on Ramos by using all of these sort of auxiliary cards that are, are friends of it. That makes sense. Cool. Um, and then there's, of course, Forgotten Ancient, which is... Uh, this deck actually shares a couple of things with Animar, I noticed. Yeah, because you're playing with plus one for counters, so... Yeah. Uh, Forgotten Ancient is three and a green for an O3 creature elemental. It says, whenever a player plays a spell, you may put a 1-1 counter on Forgotten Ancient, and then at the beginning of your upkeep, you may move any number of 1-1 counters from Forgotten Ancient onto other creatures. Oh, yeah, this is really good with Ramos. Yeah, so you don't even need to necessarily do it just at your upkeep, you could have, again, something like Rayhan, and then this will just be able to move it over, or a Spike Feeder as Carlo Gave, where you can take counters and move them around, uh, or, like, sort of the, the instant speed turrets we talked about earlier, the bow shift fate transfers to just throw all the counters on whenever you want. But because this is whenever any player casts a spell, it this thing ticks up it really fast. It tends to tick up very quickly, yeah. Yeah. Um, now, if you guys have noticed, there are a lot of legendary cards in this deck. So legendary matters is one of the big themes of the deck as well. So you're going to want to... Now, it kind of sucks because when I made this list, these cards had not spiked up in price. This uh, this one spiked like crazy because of the change to Planeswalkers. Yeah. So if you didn't hear, um, they revealed the new Jace from Ixalan and they made a rules change so that now Planeswalkers are all legendary. They have the legendary subtype. Yeah, which, and they changed the Planeswalker rule so that if I have Jace the Mind Sculptor out, I can also play, um, what's another Jace? Jace Bellerin, and, yeah. and I can have them both on the table, whereas they used to sort of, you'd have to choose one, and it would sort of work like the legendary rule. I can't play two Jace the Mind Sculptors, right. but I never could anyway. <laughs> um but also what this means is that cards that refer to the legendary subtype will now be able to target or refer to Planeswalkers. So this card, as a result, basically overnight, like quadrupled in price. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, sorry, but it is good in this deck, so we're going to talk about it. Yeah, it's Captain Sisse. It's two green and a white for a 2-2 legendary creature human soldier. You can tap to search your library for a legendary card. Reveal that card and put it into your hand. Then shuffle your library. So now Captain Sissa can find every Planeswalker, essentially. Um, pretty, pretty, pretty good. good. But you can also grab Gave, your Eldrazi that are in here. And we'll talk about Sakashima. some of these cards later. Sakashima, yeah. Prime Speaker Zagana, Legacy Weapon, Experiment Kraj. And we'll talk about all of these later. But yeah, Legacy uh, Legendary cards are really important in this deck because they all have busted abilities. Um, and in this case, they are the either cards that you want to cast with the mana you get from... Uh, Ramos, or they are necessary to make Ramos function at a higher level. And then Thalia's Lancers is the other version of it that also didn't didn't have a huge price jump, but it definitely went up a little bit. It's still cheap. This yeah. one's fine. Yeah, yeah. It's, this is definitely the budget version. It's just a five mana four four that when it enters the battlefield, you can search your library for a legendary card, put it in your hand, and shuffle your library. So very good card as well, especially for this deck. All right, let's talk about card draw. Yeah. So when you're because the one thing that you would want to go around, uh, go along with rituals is always card draw because you're sort of using cards to create mana. That usually puts you at card disadvantage. So in order to sort of balance that out, you're going to want a lot of card draw. But mm -hmm. luckily, you have access to all five colors. A so, lot of them. Yeah. This and is... This card always overperforms for me. Even if, even though it's at four mana, yeah, it definitely does. It feels like you look at it and you're like, it's not that good. And then every time I have it out, I'm just like drawing tons of cards off it. It's yeah. Fathom Mage. It's two, a green, and a blue. For a 1-1, one, one, it says whenever a 1-1 one, one counter is placed on Fathom Mage, you may draw a card, but it has Evolve. And what Evolve is, whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, if that creature has greater power or toughness than this creature... Put a 1-1 one, one counter on it. So it's a 1-1. One, one. You play any creature, basically. It put You put a counter on it. You draw a card. 
and then it's a two-two, and anything bigger than a two-two, power or toughness. So if it's so a two-three, it two, yeah. yeah, and then you kind of do that over and over and over again. But it also works with all your moving counters. Yep. So you can move a counter onto it with your spike feeders, spike weavers. It'll draw a card. Uh, you can also just flicker your Ramos, and it comes back into the battlefield as a four-four. It's definitely probably gonna be bigger than the Fathom Age. Draw a card. Your Fathom Age is too big. Move the counters off it. Flicker it. <laughs> now it's a one-one again. Start Gave, drawing more move, cards. Make a token. Put a counter. Yeah draw a card that kind of stuff yeah. yeah so essentially fathom mage often reads two mana draw a card because of the couple of cards you can move stuff onto it um but yeah this thing is just going to be a consistent card drawer over time and then the biggest card drawer in the deck is prime yeah. speaker zagana which by the way i love the casting cost of a lot of these cards because they fit really well with ramos that's interesting Pr- prime keeper is two blue blue green green which in a five color deck would not be the best casting cost but when your commander is making uh, man, a colored mana in twos, it's a perfect fit. So Prime Speaker Zagana is a 1-1, one, one, and it enters the battlefield with X plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, where X is the greatest power among other creatures you control. When it enters the battlefield, draw cards equal to its power. So if Ramos is out, you're always going to draw at least six, right? Uh, I think... Because you cast this, puts two counters on Ramos, Yep. and then it'll see six. Ramos as a 6-6. Six, six. Yeah. And that's only if Ramos has zero counters when you cast it. Yeah, sometimes Ramos might be at like 20 or whatever. And like that's the thing with Prime Speaker is that it has the ability to do to be good or to be ridiculous. Very rarely is this card going to come out and you're not going to have creatures that are really buffed up because of their plus one plus one counters. So it's kind of the thing that you if you get Prime Speaker Zagana out and a way to flicker it, you can draw through your entire deck essentially. <laughs> Yeah, be careful. You can kill yourself, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the last drawing card is Sage of Fables for two in the blue. It's a merfolk wizard. Each other c- wizard creature you control, and there are a few in this deck, enters the battlefield with an additional plus one, plus one counter on it. And you can pay two to remove a plus one, plus one counter from a creature you control to draw a card. So so once Ramos gets high enough, you could even start just use the mana to him, draw, yeah. draw cards, which I think... The thing with this deck, too, is you're often going to make 10 mana, and you may not use all of it. So you want to have activated abilities and stuff like Sage of Fable so that you can maximize the mana that you're using. Or it could be like, oh, shoot, I used all my green mana. I don't have any—I have other green cards to cast, but I have all this extra mana, and I can't cast them. I'll draw cards with Sage of Fables. I'll do other things. I will move counters around. I'll sack things to make creatures. So there's a lot of utility here with all of the card draw in sort of with the plus one, plus one counter theme. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. I also wrote experimental, as in I don't know how long these cards are going to stick around for. And one of them is a card that I hated. I thought this card sucked, and I think I might play it in this deck. <laughs> oh yeah, I think we I think we talked bad about this. At we some definitely point. did. It's Orzhov Advocist. It is a two and a white for a one four human advisor. At the beginning of your upkeep, each player may put a one one count. Two. Sorry, each player may put two one one counters on a creature he or she controls. If a player does, creatures that player's controls can't attack you or a planeswalker you control uh, until your next turn. So, so it's a choice to everybody, right? Do you want to put a two, a two plus one plus one counters on one of your creatures, or do you want to be able to attack me? Yeah. And a lot of times, I think, I mean, the reason I hated this card is, oh, everyone gets the benefit. Yeah. But this is one of the few decks, I think, where you are going to be able to take advantage of the plus one, plus one counters more than anyone else. And maybe the the reprieve of not being attacked is actually good for a deck that's trying to combo out and play 20 mana worth of cards in a just single turn. Get, yeah, Ramos is kind of trying to get to that point where I have all the pieces and now I can cash in my counters for mana, which creates the mana to blink them, to cash it in again and get yeah. in this loop. Yeah. Yeah, and like sometimes all you need is a way to get counters on consistently um, because I think that's one of the problems this deck might run into, which is I've got all my sweet combo pieces out here, but I don't have a single way to put a plus one, plus one counter on anything. Well, you just have to cast any uh, spell, though, at that point for Ramos. Yeah, it's for Ramos. But if yeah. Ramos isn't out, then I think Orzhov Activist is one of those cards. Advocates is one of those cards that helps fuel the rest of the deck. But this card might also still suck. <laughs> so who knows? Like, if you play against a deck with zero creatures, like, a Mizzix deck just, like, scoffs at this card and says, like, wow, you really put that in instead of another one. Uh, this next one is just, like, uh, any... If you got a plus one, plus one counter theme and you're in blue, then everyone's yep. going to want to play Sage of Hours. Yeah. So it's a one, one for one in a blue. It has heroic. If you target it with a spell, then you put a one, one counter on it. That usually doesn't matter. The um, real important text says remove all one, one counters from Sage of Hours for each five counters removed this way. Take an extra turn after this one. So, so let's say Ramos is you've already used Ramos once in the turn and you're using his mana to cast more spells and more spells and more spells. And Ramos is up to like 15 counters now. Well, move them all over the Sage of Hours and you just took three extra turns. Yeah. So 
The point of Sage of Hours is it's not a fun card to play against in a deck like this because you have the potential of taking multiple turns in a row. It's not it's not like remove five one one counters. You probably have the potential to go infinite with some crazy combination of cards in here. It's probably Certainly. it's not the goal of the deck, but it's, it's not the possible. goal of the deck, yeah. I mean like if I really wanted to go infinite, I'd be putting in mnemonic walls and stuff to rebuy momentary blinks and those kinds of cards. But in this case, sometimes you don't need infinite turns sometimes you only need two extra turns to to win the game and i've never cast expropriate and not one and usually you point. get like two extra turns and that's it you know yeah. if people are smart um sometimes you get four if people aren't <laughs> in which case you really win but yeah yeah you, there's not i can't think of a game where i've gotten two extra turns and not won the game yeah so sage of ours has the ability to do because ramos has such a fast ability to make a lot of stuff and then you have ways to move that over with the mana that you create from ramos so it's definitely a very dangerous card. It would be a kill on sight if I ever played against it. Uh, here's deck. another legendary. Yeah. Experiment Kraj. Two, again, same casting cost as Prime Speaker Zagana. Two, green, green, blue, blue. Experiment Kraj has all activated abilities of each other creature with a plus one, plus one counter on it. And you can tap to put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. So Experiment Kraj is also another version of Ramos. Does the activated ability only once each turn? He gets that too. Yes, he does. Yeah, he gets that yeah, too. Yeah. So it, I was it, just thinking, man, could you all of a sudden, but you're right. Yeah, yeah. so Experiment Crash can become another Ramos. It essentially comes down on the battlefield and becomes a Rehan, Ramos, and every It's like other. Sakashima. Kind yeah, it's like of, yeah. Sakashima, but even better because it's every... It's kind of like the Marisol of this deck. As long as a creature has a plus one, plus one counter on it, all of a sudden Experiment Crash now is this just like mega morphous. Oh, yeah. This is the Quicksilver elemental of this deck. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, so this card is actually, I think, really busted. Again, it's another six drop, but you're not really worried about cards. All you need to do is, yeah, remove five 1-1 one, one counters to get a six drop out yeah. and a four drop and whatever mana you happen to have had untapped at that point. Like, Ramos yeah. seems ridiculous. If you look at the uh, the ramp in this deck, too, a lot of it is two and three mana uh, ramp cards like Farseek and Kodama's Reach and stuff, and then a lot of three drop artifacts because what you want to do is essentially ramp out as fast as possible, get Ramos out in turn four if you can, and then things just go ham from there. Which is pretty fun and the nice thing too is that it's a five color deck but you don't need colored mana to play ramos and then once ramos is out he's going to fuel the five color you need so you don't color, need a yeah. ton of fixing either it actually makes the mana base in this deck relatively cheap or at least well. you could you could yeah. yeah it makes it a lot more forgiving as well because ramos yeah. will cover your butt in a lot of those cases and even a lot of like the activated abilities of crystalline crawl or um and like Fat, not Fathom Mage, sorry, um, like Gavi and stuff, only use oh, yeah. generic mana, so you don't need a lot of colored mana for this deck. All right, now that you have 10 mana from Ramos, you obviously just need to end the game. So here are just a list of some cards that can do so. <laughs> I like this. You're just like, I don't know. I don't All know. All the usual suspects as far as the biggest, most expensive game winners. Yeah. Rise like, of the Dark Realms. Seven black, one. black. Put all creature cards from graveyards onto the battlefield under your control, and you have a mana left over afterwards, too. Just saying. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, Insurrection, our old go-to. We've talked about rarely these days, but it basically threatened effects all creatures on the battlefield. You just so need one extra red for this section. Yeah, so you got to have an extra red, and then you can steal everybody's creatures, and uh, they have haste until end of turn, and then you return them at end of turn. But generally, you would return generally. them to a bunch of dead people. <laughs> yeah, they're going back because the player died. Yeah, uh, Tooth and Nail, you can be entwined for one extra mana, which is pretty good. Time stretch. This is probably the real game winner of the deck. It was like, hey, give me two just extra immediately turns. two extra turns. And immediately what did we just say? time stretch. Yeah, if you turn four time stretch, whoa, what the heck? You're, you're gonna do great. Oh my gosh, you don't have progenitus though. Where's progenitus? Uh, I, I, you know, I was thinking about putting progenitus in, but if you look at the creature, it's just it's protection from everything but board wipes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point, but still progenitus. I we know, call right? it progenitus mana. And then you have, of course, you also have expropriate Eldrazi. Um, like being able to cast Emrakul the Promised End very early seems great, and you might even be able to cast this with like tons of mana left over, depending on what's in your graveyard. Oh, too. Man. Expropriate. Yeah, expropriate. expropriate. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Uh, I literally have never cast expropriate and not one. Yeah, because everyone gives you well, extra never, turns. I've never resolved it. It's yeah. gotten countered a couple times. But um, another important thing about this deck, though, is you have a ton of extra mana sometimes. So gemstone array is a perfect way to filter the mana into different colors or just store oh, it up over you time. Can store it because yeah, if I've got twenty counters on Ramos, that means on your turn I just put some on Gemstone Array. Mm -hmm. On, you know, Megan's turn I put some more. And then so yeah, I'm getting two for one mana for the price of two, but yeah. because I can sort of carry it over, it's worth it. That's yeah. a really good one. And then I have a card like Crystal Shard in here as well, just to be able to bounce Ramos whenever you need to. I think this card's really underrated. 
it's kind of erratic. You have portal. a you have erratic portal, right? Yeah, yeah in your deck, yeah. So I think I toyed with it. I think I took it out, but yeah, it's basically the same card. Those those erratic portal and crystal shard uh, allow you to bounce creatures if they if uh, the person doesn't yeah. pay one. But you usually are aiming yourself, and you're going, well, I'm not going to pay the one. I just yeah. bounce the creature. Yeah. Another really, I'm just going to list off some more cards because I didn't have categories for them. Vanish into memory. If Ramos is like a sixteen sixteen. You draw 16 cards, and then you discard four. Seems good. <laughs> uh, Teferi's Protection, obviously, oh, is very good in this deck. that card is so good. I wanted to put a couple cards in here that just saved your board, like Heroic Intervention, because yeah. if you... if you, I mean, I even thought about putting Marchesa in here, and I might still, because just getting your creatures back is one of the most important parts about this deck. is really good in this deck, actually. Yeah, all your creatures yeah. come on back. Yeah, and um, Dethrone gives them counters, so you can kind of get going that way. Yeah. How did you not put Marchesa in there? Well, it, she was in there for a second, and I was like, I kind of put Marchesa in any deck and fit her into <laughs> <laughs> Someone's gonna call me on it. Yes, well, I'll probably throw her back in there. And then Revelark is actually one of my oh, favorite yeah. cards in the deck because it. So when it enters the bow, leaves the battlefield, you return up to two cargo creature cards with power two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Well, you've got Captain Sisse, you've got Crystal and Crawler, you have so many different cards you can bring back. Uh, like a lot of them are small because they're supposed to grow, grow like Forgotten yeah. Ancient Fathom Mage, Zagana, Gave, 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 yeah, yeah. Even oh, yeah. Glenelendra is like literally the best card in this deck. Oh man, Glenelendra is so good. <laughs> That's oh, how man, you win you the move game. Counters and then you, you can lock just him out everything? with Glenelendra and Ramos, and then you take three extra turns, and then you Insurrection or Rise of the Dark Realms or you Expropriate, and then you just hit them in the air with the twenty twenty Ramos Dragon Engine. This sounds. Fun. It sounds yeah. like a very Jimmy deck. It is 100% a Jimmy deck. There is a ton of creatures. And and, and, and your game plan is make my creatures big. Big and protect them. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's a, essentially it. Um, the, oh, there was one card I did want to talk about, which was... So, this is a card that you I would th that EDH Rec recommended, similar to how you were Pan talking about Panharmonicon. But I just don't think it's that great in the deck. It's Trans Guild Courier, which is a four-mana artifact creature golem. And it's a 3-3 that says Trans Guild Killer Courier is all colors. So for four mana, you'd be able to put five counters on Ramos. So you don't, it's always a ritual that gets you 10 mana. It's always a ritual that gets you 10 if you're able to play it with Ramos out and not having to use his ability. For me, I just because this card doesn't do anything with any other card in the deck, I don't think it's worth it. If it's a card that solely is built for just one thing in your deck, mm -hmm. I just don't think it's going to be worth the spot. So I'd much rather have a card that has a little more utility. Abzan Charm. Abzan Charm, Basically, yeah. one less mana gets you the five counters but if you don't need that you, you can, can exile a creature yeah draw exactly. some cards yeah. yeah so that's why i would cut trans guild courier from a deck like this um even though it does seem really cool that it's all colors and it's colorless and it fits within the theme but no thanks not for me thanks but no thanks all right so that is the ramos dragon engine deck in a nutshell the links the tapped out list is in the comments below not the comments the more info section below the video but it's time for two of the listeners what, what do you, do you think? What do you think of this Ramos Dragon Engine deck? And how would you build it? What did we miss? Or, you know, what other directions could you go? I think there are a lot of directions with this deck. I think Storm is probably definitely a direction. Yeah, Storm um, would be insane, I think, if yeah. you really want. Because you, you just take an extra turn, and then that turn you just go off. You're searching well, all your, your cards create mana if you do it right. And you yeah. can play all the blinky cards, basically. And uh, Yeah, because you're just trying to win in one turn as yeah. opposed to this, which may win over two or three turns. Yeah. So, yeah, have fun, all you Storm players. Have fun also when people are like... Kill you on sight? From then on, or just don't want to play with you anymore, because, yeah. you know, it's not that fun to watch somebody go like, Storm Count 4, Storm Count 5, cast this. Storm I mean, this six. deck I don't think is going to be fun to play against, because it's a lot of play with my own board, and then steal your board. <laughs> Yours looks fine, though, because it's just make creatures, a lot of it's going to be done through, like, combat and stuff. Like, it's yeah. not just going to, like, immediately... It's just going to play big, scary stuff earlier than it should. But yeah. that's what Commander's about. It is. Well, Commander's about whatever you feel. I'd like, like to win through combat damage with this deck, too. That's my favorite way to win the game. So, All right. My favorite way to order cards oh. is at cardkingdom.com slash command zone. Tell me more. Well, if I want things like Captain Sisse, <laughs> which it, I don't think that card's ever going down. So if you do want it, you probably want it now. But also, you know, the Insurrections, the Tooth and Nails, these cool Eldrazi's, all this stuff. Then if I use the affiliate link, again, cardkingdom.com slash command zone, then I'm helping this podcast stay alive. I'm helping game nights stay alive. So we do appreciate your support. You're going to buy magic cards anyway. Use the affiliate link. That's it. 
Yeah, That's the pitch. Hunt, hunt for some good deals. Yeah. They have a lot there. All yeah. right, Ultra Pro, also the sponsor of this show. When you're at Card Kingdom, you can buy a new playmat. You can buy some sleeves. The Eclipse sleeves, highly touted, highly reviewed by the professor and ourselves. That cool uh, backpack, the Citadel backpack. I don't know if Card Kingdom has it, but if they don't, you know, ordering Ultra Pro stuff anywhere helps us out. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been using that a lot, and I really like it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. All right. Now it's time to move on to the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic, Josh. Lee Kwai, <laughs> what's cool these days? Um, okay. I have one. Right. It's not out yet, but I'm excited about it. It's Stranger Things 2. Have you seen the, the trailer for this? I saw the first trailer. The one with Thriller or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a great first trailer. First of all, sweet that. trailer. I don't know who did it. Um, I love the theme, too. Like, yeah. oh, yeah, I love it. Um, also, oh, man, I hope it's good. I really hope it's good. Yeah, do you want to explain why you don't think it might be good? Because it is 100% true. Yeah, I'm worried because, and I think people don't understand, but the production cycle for Stranger Things 2 is so truncated because they were an unexpected hit, and they were basically, you know, reading between the lines, pressured into getting the second season done as soon as possible to capitalize on all the hype from season one. And it's usually just a recipe for disaster because... This happens all the time in Hollywood, and you'll notice that the second movies in a series um, or a, a season or you know a TV show or movies or whatever is often worse than the first season. And why is that? It's the same people usually doing it. It's because they usually have years to work on the first season or the first. And they movie. did. They pitched it to like a ton of. Everyone studios said, said no. no. They've they been developing was, the script forever. They've been refining it and fixing it, and finally, when it somebody says, "Okay, let's make that," it's the best version of it. But now it's a big hit, and they're like, "Okay." We need season two or we need the sequel to come out and we're going to pick a date and it has to come out on that date and that date is 18 months from now. Yeah. And you're like, uh, so uh, I have to write the script in six months because we have to be shooting six months from now mm-hmm. because we have to shoot for four months and then we only have eight months to do post-production before it has to come out. It's just like... You have much less time to do pickups. You have much less time to do revisions. You have much less time to just do pretty think, much everything. To just think out what you want to do. Much less time to just yeah. do the casting. I am not envious of them whatsoever. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that things can't be good in that situation, but Sometimes it's like... Sometimes it does, yeah. It's luck at that point, I feel like. It's catching lightning in a bottle. Uh, it's yeah. very hard. You can't just sort of like, I don't know, professional your way to it by like crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's and making sure everything's in place because, you know, yeah. you're just rush, 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 rush. So- Luckily for us, the cast is incredible. Um, there's a lot of highlights about the show that aren't necessarily tied to production. Um, so we'll see what happens. I hope. I really want it to be good. I'm worried it won't be, but it's coming out soon. I am excited. I am hyped. So Stranger Things 2. If you didn't watch the first season, that should be the big message here, right? You should watch the first season of Stranger Things so that you're ready for season two. So if you didn't check it out, we talked about it a ton when it was... Uh, when it was sort of the big thing. You have t-shirts from it too. It might be like my favorite. I'm pretty sure it's like my favorite like series of anything in like the last, I don't know, seven or eight years. Yeah. I mean, it's small. So it's like, right? Like Game of Thrones, I really like, but it's a big thing. There's been some ups and downs with it. You know, the best episode of Game of Thrones are probably, you know, a little bit better than the best episode of Stranger Things, but Stranger Things was so, I'm going to say perfect. It wasn't perfect, but so perfect for what it was in such a small gap that I, I would say that by that measure, I think it's probably my favorite thing in the last like seven or eight years besides hardcore history. Cool. All right. What else you is your favorite thing? What else? You know what else is your favorite thing? <laughs> my other favorite thing is the Masters of Modern Podcast. That's our sister podcast, Matt. Uh, Alex Kessler and Ben Bateman. I almost forgot their names somehow. <laughs> uh, they talk about modern as uh-huh. a format, yep. all things competitive magic. You can find them on Twitter at the MMCast. They also have a Facebook page. I don't know the URL for that offhand. Uh, but the best place to find them is on collected.company right next to us. Yeah. Check them out. Make sure you check them out. Make sure you also check out the video versions of these podcasts at youtube.com slash the command zone podcast. We are in a new set. We're going to reveal what this whole new set looks like when the next Game Nights comes out. So stay tuned for that. The only way to go and see that is thanks to uh, our YouTube. We're not supposed to tell them that we're that, uh, that it's about Exelon yet. Yeah. It's not. okay. We let it slip. It's about adventure on they the high seas. They told us on the 15th. But you know what? The good thing is no one's still listening. Yeah. Yeah, no one's still watching. Oh, my gosh. Right Watch the tweets are going to come flooding in. <laughs> The editor for the show is Terry Robertson. He edits these podcasts that you're watching right now. Maybe at he YouTube. cut out that part. Yeah, totally. Yeah, did he? he did. YouTube.com slash The Command Zone Podcast. And special thanks, of course, to Jeffrey Palmer at Living Cards MTG. He does the opening and closing animations of the show, which you are about to see right now. 
See you guys next week. Peace. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>